So the first question we have is from Marjan. Um, and the question is, if you are measuring the effect of an intervention in a way where blinding is not possible, would that introduce bias into the outcome? Um, well, I guess using the tool, it depends on the outcome. If the outcome is um, all cause mortality, no, it will not introduce bias. If the outcome um, is um, patient reported pain, it probably will if the patient is not blinded. And we have a question from Neil. Often a researcher will be present administrating self-reported outcome measures to participants. In that case, does it make sense that the reviewer would need to consider how blinding of both participant and the researcher might influence the outcome since one might influence the other? Yes, it's a very, um, very good question. Um, it's um, because it's, it's, it's often misunderstood. It, in that situation, the ROP2 is constructed um, so that both parties need to be blinded. Um, to have a blinded interviewer doing an interview on an unblinded patient, that would be problematic. The, the, the overall situation in that assessment situation would be regarded as not blinded and also the vice versa situation. We also have a question from Stefan. Um, what is the use of single blind in open studies if it means the patients know the treatment they are on? According to the algorithm, a fully open study gets the same risk of bias rating. Um, I'll have to have a look at the algorithm there. Yeah. So could you repeat the question? So the question is, what is the use of single blind in open studies if it means that patients know the treatment they are on? According to the algorithm, a fully open study gets the same risk of bias rating. Perhaps I could try to- Well, I mean, a fully, if the, if the, well, it depends on the outcome, doesn't it? Oh, it depends on who is the outcome assessor. Um, uh, if if the outcome assessor is the patient, the patient reported outcome, obviously that will be either some concerns or high risk of bias. Um, in a situation where there is um, the patient is not blinded, but there's a blinded outcome assessor, and the uh, the outcome is. Um, patient behavior or a physiological measure, um, that would not necessarily be high risk of bias. They'd probably be low risk of bias if there's, um, if it's regarded that um, that assessment had, uh, um, that the outcome assessor were not aware of the intervention received. Perhaps I can, I can comment also, uh, Ella. Uh, I think in, in, in few, uh, trials, uh, the way it's reported, it tried to say that the outcome assessment was blinded. And uh, very often people using the risk of bias tool are sort of misled by the way it's reported. So uh, you need to be very careful to, to really distinguish um, who is the outcome assessor and whether the outcome assessor was actually blinded. So just to give you an example, very often in rheumatic disease uh, uh, trial, uh, they are saying it's patient reported outcome, patients cannot be blinded, but they're always saying the data collector uh, is, is blinded. But actually, if the patient is not blinded, the outcome assessor, the one who's going to, to give the level of pain, uh, is unblinded. So I think that's a point that people need to be careful with. Brilliant, thank you both. Um, our next question is from Francisca. What considerations should be taken when assessing risk of bias in the measurement of adverse events? Isabel spoke about the context of passive collection of outcome data. 
Yeah, so the context of, uh, so that's really where you you can have an issue with uh, um, uh, with risk of bias assessment is, is that you are in a situation where you might uh, uh, be assessing some outcomes more frequently than you, you have the opportunity to assess and to detect adverse event more frequently in one group than in other. Okay, so that's really when, um, and uh, the example, uh, uh, the, the classical example, uh, or one of two examples are really related to, let's say you have an intervention where uh, part of the intervention is that the, the patient has to go and see his doctor uh, uh, every month, while in the other group, they are just going to, to be for up every three months. Okay. Just because the patient is coming every three ma every month, well, the, the doctor will be more likely to detect adverse event than in the other group. Okay, so for some outcomes such as adverse event, it might be responsible for a, a bias. And it's the same for some outcomes and some exam that might be triggered by an adverse event. So for example, you have more um, uh, headache in, in one group, you might be more, the doctors might be more likely to explore this ex headache and to do some tests and more likely to find some problems. It's not because there's more problems, it's just they perform more tests. So it might be responsible for a bias. Great. So it's really related to the question one. Okay, and our next question is from Amir, who asks, does this mean that rehabilitation trials, like in physiotherapy, are inherent, inherently at risk of bias, as outcome assessor and patients would usually know their allocation? Example of common outcomes of pain, range of joint movement, self-assessment on functional activity. Yes, um, well, that has been an ongoing debate um, and uh, to some extent um, criticism of the of the previous version of the tool and the um, it's just um, um, a difficult a thorny issue um, the way the the, um, the tool has uh, tried to solve this issue is by actually by the signal question four or five um, it's um, asking whether it's likely that the assessment would influence by knowledge of the intervention. So in the physiotherapy, in the trials with patient reported outcomes, um, is the, the central question then is to which extent um, is the trial context such that um, assessments are overrated by patients? Um, then it'll be high risk. But if we trust, if we trust the trial of setting up the trial context, facilitating a neutral um, equipoise between the the two interventions, um, then the it will be some concerns. Uh, it's just um, a, a, a balance between what would be regarded as a relevant outcome and patient reported outcomes are are generally regarded as more relevant at least to patients um, however they are also more vulnerable to bias and we need to maneuver between those two i think the, yeah, the perhaps just the idea that it's not because blinding is not possible that we should consider that there's no risk of bias so I mean, if blinding is not possible, you can still have a higher risk of bias. Our next question is from Ralph. Um, in the last single, in the last signaling question, it was mentioned that an active control leads to some concerns. Could you please comment on this issue in more detail? Um, I hope that I said that. Um, active control was not regarded a problematic issue. 
we could come back. So the the um, the problematic issue is, is when an experimental intervention is compared to a no treatment or usual care control. Um, and uh, if an experimental intervention is compared to another active control group, it's uh, it's regarded uh, a green flag, but uh, as it doesn't translate into um, uh, low risk of bias, but some concerns, I, I call it the green flag yellow here. Okay, great. Um, there is a there's a question from um, Jacqueline um, from the publishing perspective. Well, sorry, from the perspective of publishing, what do editors and reviewers expect to see in a published report? Um, I, I did want to just flag that Cochrane is piloting risk of bias too on a, a selection of reviews, and we're developing checklists for the publication of protocols and reviews, um, and what editors should be looking for and what authors should be reporting. Um, but also just to, to to hand over to the um, to the speakers today to see if they have any sort of additional things or specific things they think should be seen in a published report. Um, well, I mean, obviously the, um, the 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 kind of overall assessment of low risk, some concerns of high risk, uh, should be reported. But uh, I guess some information of how that assessment was uh, was reached in in an appendix would be very nice uh, isabel maybe you have another view there uh, i think for, for me what's the most useful figure for the readers and for is when you have the first plot with the risk of bias assessment for all domain next to it i think that's uh, the really the the figure best representing the result uh, and then uh, we want to see the, the assessment for each domain, for each outcomes here, and probably some explanation that, you know, uh, rely on the on the signaling questions. Yeah, and just to add to that, it's not just the answer to the signaling question is why, for me, what is important is not to say yes, it's why you say yes to the signaling question. Yeah, and if anyone would like to see the guidance that we've developed so far as part of the pilot, um, please do get in contact with me afterwards. I'm happy to share what we have. 